Hi, this is the second of the three lecture snippets for the calculation of electric field through integration. Now, these three examples are specifically chosen because electric field for these exact three situations can be calculated using Gauss's law. And by comparison, this will illustrate the power of Gauss's law and how much it makes your life simpler. Now, there are other cases uh, where you actually cannot use Gauss's law and you do have to use these techniques. So, um, so for that also, it's good for you to know how to do this if you have to do it. Now, if you haven't seen the first uh, uh, lecture snippet on calculating the electric field of an infinite line of charge, I recommend that you go back and look at those first because um, the setup for this will be similar but more complicated. So this is a calculation of electric field due to an infinite plane. So I'm going to set up a plane in the vertical direction and imagine a point here and you are trying to calculate an electric field at this point due to this plane. Um, counting up all contributions from all the different parts of the plane. So let's start. Okay, let me draw a representation of the infinite plane of charge uh, in a perspective view. So this would be a picture of the plane uh, a little bit from the side. I'm drawing the boundaries for the plane, but you should imagine the plane being infinite without boundary. So we are interested in the electric field at this point here at some distance d from the plane. So let me set up my axis for setting up this calculation here. I'm going to say that the plane is on the x, y axis. So here it would look like x axis coming towards me, y axis upward, and the z axis to the right. So this will, will be my x, y, z axis. So we are going to use Coulomb's law again also. But as with the last time, we have to break up this plane into tiny little pieces so that for each one of those pieces we can say it looks like a point charge. So let me pick a representative point here. I'm going to pick a representative area element. Let me draw some guidelines here. So these are guidelines for where y is equal to 0 and these are guidelines along the x-axis where x is equal to 0. So let me pick a point here. Um, so this point will be at, um, this will be at some coordinate y and at some coordinate x. And it'll be at some distance from this point. Now, I, because it, uh, I'm trying to draw a three-dimensional thing in two-dimensional surface. I want you to use your imagination uh, what this distance should look like. When you go through the geometry exercise trying to figure out this distance here, you should get square root of x squared plus y squared plus d squared. Square root. Of. So that's going to be distance from this little element of charge to the point where we are trying to calculate what is the electric field. So we use Coulomb's law again. As a reminder, this is the Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law says that electric field due to a point charge is equal to K charge of the point charge divided by distance squared. And because it's a vector, um, I have to multiply by r hat. So here, r hat vector would be an extension of this line that we have drawn from the charge to the point. So let me extend it by a little bit and label this as my r hat. So this vector is my r hat direction. 
All right. So once again, we start by saying this small part of the overall charge contributes a small amount of electric field, dE. And this small amount of electric field, the magnitude is given by Coulomb's law. K times the amount of charge. Oh, I forgot to specify the charge density of this plane charge. Let's say the charge density is sigma. And the way charge density is defined is the total amount of charge divided by the area. So if this was an um, actual infinite plane, then it would have an infinite amount of charge. So here, to get the amount of charge that's in this small area element, it will be sigma times the area of this element. So that should be this. Sigma times the area element will be the width dx times the height dy. That will give me the area of that little piece that you are seeing. So that's the numerator. The denominator is distance squared. We have distance worked out like last time. So when I square it, I get x squared plus y squared plus d squared. Oh, and uh, because it's a vector, I have to have this r hat vector. All right. Now, um, this, uh, figuring out this R vector takes a little bit of work. So I'm just going to do this quickly. And um, um, when you do multivariable calculus, you will learn all this. <laughs> so uh, let me draw a representation of that R vector in this uh, axis that I have drawn here. So the, so the R hat vector should look like something like this. This is close enough to the R hat vector. Then there are two angles that I can use to characterize this R hat vector. There's the angle we do respect to the Z axis. Uh, I am going to label this with the symbol theta. In your multivariable calculus class, they will actually use phi, but I'm going to use uh, theta is the physics convention. And uh, for the second angle, because this is in three-dimensional space, you have to imagine a projection of this vector onto the xy plane. So uh, I guess I had this vector go in the, um, both the negative and negative y direction. So when I take the projection, let's say a projection along the xy plane looks something like this. This is the projection then the angle with respect to the x-axis, that will be phi. So when you write out the r-hat vector with these parameters in mind, then the r-hat vector is equal to cosine of phi times sine of theta x-hat plus sine of phi times sine of theta y hat plus cosine theta z hat. All right, <laughs> it's already getting pretty complicated. By the way, in your textbook, uh, they do this in a way where they use the information from the previous um, problem with the infinite line. That would be probably an easier way to do it. I just want you to Sure, the most difficult way possible. Um, so to figure out each of these, you draw the triangle again. But here is a, a shortcut of a sort. So let me give you the answers to this without um, proving them. If you want, you can go through the triangle drawing exercise and prove this for yourself. But the idea here is that you would never actually have to do this. So let me um, give you the x component first. So the x component is x over square root of x squared plus y squared plus d squared. 
It's a surprisingly simple expression. And the same thing for y component. It's y over square root of x squared plus y squared plus d squared. And what do you think the g component will be? Well, if you guessed d, um, because that's the g component of this long vector, d over square root of x squared plus y squared plus d squared. If you guessed that, you would be right. So those are the uh, three uh, components of this red vector. So let me write that all out. Oh, it doesn't look like I have a lot of space here. Let me move these expressions first. It's a nice part about this being a, on a computer. All right, so that will give me some space to write more. Okay, so all of this is equal to, I'm not going to write k sigma dx dy every single time, so let me just write it out once. k sigma dx times dy. And I'm going to factor out this common denominator for each of these three terms so that this common denominator outside here will be x squared plus y squared plus d squared raised to the power of 3 half. All right, so the remaining part of the r hat vector is x times x hat plus y times y hat plus d times g hat. All right, so to calculate the total electric field, we are going to do the same thing as before. We are going to integrate this expression dE over the whole plane. So what that whole plane means is now we have to do the double integral because the plane is a two-dimensional object and you can actually see it here. We have two integration variables, dx and dy, multiplying to each other. So we are going to have to do double integrals, one with respect to x and another with respect to y. So it will be x and y from negative infinity to positive infinity for both of them. And when we complete all of this, we are supposed to get the total electric field. Now. When you look at this carefully, you will realize that we get similar simplification as before. The simplification we had the last time was that the uh, last time the y term went away because the term with y was an odd function. So when you did integral over a symmetric interval, it added up to zero. Here you see the same thing. So with the y component, it's a function of y, that's odd. Here, the no denominator is even. So this uh, times all of this is an odd function of y. So when I do the integral with respect to y, it's all going to go to 0. So let me do that and save myself some effort and space. This is 0. And the same thing happens to the x, because this time we are integrating with respect to L x also. So let me cross this out, and x goes to 0 as well. So this time also, there's really only one component that doesn't go to 0. So let me write it out. Uh, let's move the other those expressions first. All right, selecting all those squiggles and moving them down here. All right, that ought to give me some room. Okay, so we are going to write um, um, the simplified version. So we have integral with respect to x going from negative infinity to positive infinity. Let me pull out dx up to this far because the dx doesn't depend on why I can pull out this far. And 
that comes after having done the integral with respect to y uh, going from evaluated from negative infinity to positive infinity dy. So the whole integrand, having factored those two things out, is k sigma d g hat over x squared plus y squared plus d squared raised to the power of 3 half. All right. If this is beginning to look similar to what we did the last time, then yeah, it is similar to what we did the last time. So this is not an easy integral. Um, we have to use all from alpha. In fact, um, after, you guys remember what the form of the integral looked like after the first integral. It wasn't any simpler then. So the second integral is going to be even more complicated. So let me semi-admit defeat here because this is the difficult integral that uh, if I try to do it by hand, this video will be an hour long. So I'm going to push as much as possible to Wolfram Alpha. Let's see if Wolfram Alpha will do double integral. All right. Here's all from alpha. So I don't need to enter k, sigma, or d because they are constant, or g hat. So I'm going to be integrating 1 over x squared plus y squared plus d squared raised to the power of 3 halves. And this time I'm going to do definite integral. That's me pushing off as much work as possible to all from alpha. And let me try to specify this in natural language and see if Wolfram Alpha understands it correctly. So I'm integrating this from x equals negative infinity to x equals positive infinity. And also from y equals negative infinity to y equals positive infinity. I'm hoping Wolfram Alpha will understand that, that means double integral. We'll see. All right, that is the input I meant. And, oh, wow, there is an actual answer to that. Where is that pi coming from? So whenever I see pi, I assume there was some um, uh, trick substitution reason involved that I don't want to know about. <laughs> All right, let me copy this off to my board so that I can continue from there. That's so tiny. Um, all right, uh, let me put it here. Okay, now I can refer to that to write down what my integral should be. Um, scroll down. Okay, so I can say this whole thing is equal to, um, there's a still g hat. So the electric field is in the direction of g hat. Hopefully that matches with your intuition. Times k sigma d times, and now the rest is where the integral comes in. It's uh, times 2 pi over square root of d squared. Um, I think this is, math uh, this is because Mathematica is assuming that d could be a complex number. I know d is a real number, positive in fact, so let me simplify that just to d as I'm writing it down. All right, that's it. That's the answer. Oh, look at how it simplifies. Looks like d actually cancels out. So I get an expression for electric field that does not depend on distance. So let me uh, write down the full expression. The full expression is electric field as a vector is equal to I have k sigma and 2 pi so 2 pi k sigma times g hat that's it it's a constant value it's a very simple answer that um, 
that is surprising given how difficult this would have been mathematically if I didn't admit defeat and use the Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> and this is what you will see when you see the application of Gauss's law. Using Gauss's law, this problem can be done in less than five minutes. I have done it in class in less than five minutes. And while doing it in less than five minutes, you don't have to know all this multivariable calculus stuff that I didn't bother explaining because I knew explanation would take so long. So this is the calculation of electric field um, using integration for the infinite plane uh, of charges. And as you can see, the result is pretty simple. But if we were trying to approach this with integration method, the calculation would have been very complicated. One that you definitely cannot do during an exam because you don't have Wolfram Alpha during the exam. All right, I have one more example. I traditionally don't do this example in lecture because it's way too complicated. But hey, I'm making a video. I can edit it. So um, I thought I'd give it a try. So I'll see you in the next video. Bye.